Welcome back to another episode of the Resellers Mindset Podcast. My name is Mike, also known as the Used Book Guy on YouTube, along with my friend and fellow full-time reseller, Johnny B. We help people start and grow their reselling businesses from the ground up. We also have a weekly Zoom call and private Discord for all YouTube members. Head on over to youtube.com backslash usebookguy to join the channel and gain access to the full-length podcast, Zoom call, and private Discord today. Let's get into this week's episode. What is up, everybody? Welcome into episode 33. <laughs> Johnny B's holding in his lamp already. We have friendly banter before we do these things and after we do these things. If you only knew what we talked about then, that's where the real juicy stuff is. Today's topic, though, is basically the lifeblood of any reselling business is cash flow. And for us as being media sellers, it's, I mean, you that's all there is, is cash flow when it comes to selling media. It's different for other categories, other business models, but bulk media. I mean, we're just going to kind of dive into it here. And JB is going to take us away with kind of what cash flow looks like for his business. And, you know, is he chasing a, a 20 hours, you know, bill, or is he fine with taking a dollar and spending a dollar somewhere else? So uh, take us away, eBay man. All right. So cash flow, for those not in the know, is basically money coming back to you that goes into the bank. It's clear. It's all yours to spend and do what you want with. Yay. So with that, you want continuous cash flow um, and you can get more cash flow with multiple revenue streams. So like if you did eBay and Amazon, kind of like Mike here, that's multiple streams to generate a larger cash flow pile. The more cash flow you have, the more options you have. Um, Because without the monies, you can't do the things you need to do. Um, And cash flow is after your expenses, in my opinion, like if you got a rent or a storage unit um, or a warehouse like myself or half a warehouse like myself um, and your gas that you need to go sourcing with, your cost of goods, all this, that, and the other. Now, what I like to use my cash flow is just buying more product or what I've done recently is a lot of my cash flow. My biggest expense right now is my employee. Honestly, it's more than my rent. My rent's pretty cheap. I got lucky. Um, but most of that just goes toward giving her more hours to work, to have a bigger output, which will generate more cash flow. Now I'll, I'll pause there. Cause I want to talk about catch up time with cash flow, and I'll let Mike talk about cash flow in general. Yeah, cash flow for media, it's so intensive. You don't really think about it when you first start, right? Because you just, you know, you're out scanning books, CDs, DVDs, and you see the accepts and you see it's going to pay you $5, right? That's what this the phone app says. But in actuality, you're not going to get that $5 for, you know, three, four weeks, six weeks. So you're, you're giving your dollar up today to get five or 10 in a month. So what happens here is if you get to a point where, you're giving up too many dollars in the front end, you're going to have nothing pretty quick here and you're going to have nothing but inventory sitting there. Now, the benefit to Amazon compared to eBay is most Amazon sellers don't have a death pile, right? So yeah. people send their stuff into Amazon. It'll sell. It's just going to take time. Now, if you're doing only eBay, your dollars, if you don't take the initiative to list the items, I mean, you you got a cash flow problem very fast. And I, I don't even think it relates to media. I think overall, no matter what category you're selling, there's so much money that's just tied up. And I guess we can kind of say, like, if I gave you a dollar in a year or a dollar today, like you would spend a dollar much more smarter in a year than you would today. So even if you buy like bad buys, it's just part of business, right? If you can break even or even get less with Amazon, right, their fees, uh, you could sell something for a quarter loss and it still would be cheaper than having Amazon dispose of it. So if you can take that money back out, you're going to basically spend it smarter today. And you, you should be finding better quality items because, you know, as you're out there sourcing, you're, you're going to develop relationships. You're going to know what stores are better, uh, where to find the better items. So if you get a dollar today, it's not going to be, you know, as valuable as a dollar in 12 months. So say you have something sitting there for a while and especially with eBay, right? best offer. So you get a low ball offer for, you know, five bucks. You had to list it for 20 bucks. Well, you know, I would argue that take it, take it and go, right? It's been sitting there for a while. You can better redeploy that money today. And you can turn that five dollars probably into a lot more than the $20 you're going to sit around and never get waiting for it to sell on eBay. Right. I mean, there's something you've said for longer dollar later, if you wait and decline offers. But for me, 
I'm with Mike. I'm going to take the money and run and reinvest it to get more dollars. That, that's all this game is, is compounding your money and over and over again with your, you know, the only way to do that is with cash flow. Because if you can't buy more product to then list or send into Amazon, you can't generate more cash flow. You're just going to get the residuals from the previous work you've already done. That's the, that's the long game for us is just pumping it, most of it back into the business. Now we're, I say most here. I mean, you got to pay your bills and stuff. And sometimes, occasionally, you got to pay yourself. Um, occasionally. Not much, in my opinion, if you're taking this uh, beyond the hobbyist and possibly the part-timer. Um, part-timers can do this on a serious level, and they can pop the majority of their money back in. Maybe they want to use their cash flow to go on cruises or vacation of some kind. That's cool. Uh, for, but for me, I'm going to pump it back into the business, most of it. Um, I'm going to pay for my personal bills and my business bills because they're different, right? Outside of that, I pump it back in. And my, what I mean my personal bills, I, I, I hungry. I like to eat. So I uh, got to have a meal every now and then. Keeps me going. I like my coffee, too. Got to have coffee. That's a personal bill, not a business bill. Do you, uh, do you, uh, do, do you buy, like premium starbucks coffee or do you buy like the the middle of nowhere texas somebody made it in their backyard kind of stuff it's a breakfast blend medium roast that i pick up at the grocery store for 589 a bag it takes me a week to go through the bag but that uh, that fills not one cup of coffee not two cups of coffee but three cups of coffee every day dude that's those three cups of coffee is more coffee than i drink probably in three years uh but hey it keeps you going right it's just right, money it's though, two like... pots of coffee a day but i'm getting off topic here I, I i pay for my personal bills and my business bills that's what i pay myself uh, but i'm not really paying myself i'm paying myself to keep going essentially yeah, the but rest your, bills, goes... your bills though that's like paying yourself right because yeah, most people's definitely. paycheck go to their bills right i consider when i pay my bills it's basically you know i'm paying myself to be able to afford the like the the basic necessities of living right right and i took a trip recently a sourcing trip uh four or five days worth and we ate out i normally don't eat out but it was like no choice because i'm out and about so it's kind of nice um and it's a write-off it's a business write-off actually uh because the employee was with me and we discussed business while we we're eating if you didn't know you can write down what was discussed have both of you sign it that's your meals now a write-off did you splurge or were you a dollar menu guy no i splurged I splurged. I mean, we're, we, i wasn't in east texas anymore i was in the big city life so yeah i mean gotta Got to spoil myself a little bit. Um, I do think, though, like kind of we're on the topic of like fun things. I do think it is important, even for somebody like you or like me, is like to maybe set like maybe it's a percentage or maybe, you know, like when me and Deb were trying to get out of debt, like we used to use like an envelope system. Right. So this yeah, is an envelope for too, fun yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. So like I do think it is important for people to kind of get something back out of it, right? Because if you just keep, you know, dumping your money into inventory, especially if you're not listing, especially if it's not selling the way it needs to sell, it's going to be lights out for your business pretty quick. So I do think it is important to kind of take a little bit of money out and be like, hey, well, you know, out of the thousand dollars I made this month reselling, a hundred dollars is for me to go to the casino and spin the slots, like something like that. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, this was technically a vacation week because I hadn't been out of the warehouse in a year and four months. So, well, I haven't been out of, because I did storage units before, I haven't been out of the, my business for about a year and four months. So it was, it was a vacation for me, a working vacation, but a vacation nonetheless. It felt good. It felt a little weird, but it felt good at the same time. Was but, it uh, like uh, when you first started, like, at least for, I can admit that I didn't realize how much money I would have to put into building an Amazon business to get it yeah. to the point where I was consistently getting, you know, thousand plus dollar paychecks every two weeks like i i won't 100 can sit here and say i didn't because with ebay right you go buy something uh for two bucks i list it it sells for 40 i get that money right then and there with amazon it's different and i i was not prepared and you could i mean i'm curious to see what your mindset is behind this but like it's it takes a lot of money even at a dollar items like i'm buying books for a dollar like you're talking thousands and thousands of yeah. these you have to find and buy and finding them also has to be taken into consideration because that's your time, that's your gas, that's your vehicle expenses, you know, that's your food while you're out traveling. There's so many other expenses and it kind of caught me off guard, honestly. And I do think it is one of those things a lot of people don't talk about is like when you first start out, you want to run as fast as you can. But I, I highly caution people to walk slowly, let the, let the money start flowing back in, and then you kind of can ramp up. 
Well, I'm going to have a different approach. I took a different approach than most would um, because I left my corporate job with some money, um, both saved up and I was a partner. So I got it. I sold my shares because we operated like a law firm. I sold it back to the company and they wrote me a nice big check. So I was good for a year, but I already saw that it was working because I hadn't jumped in the full time ship. Um, But when I saw that it was continuously going up after three months, I'm like, okay, it compounds. This is neat. Um, so that's where I made a decision to give my businesses notice uh, three months. So I, then I saw over the course of the three months, because I could I could take it back within the three months, right? If I didn't see it continues to go up, just to make sure. So over six months span, I saw it was compounding. Um, but I wasn't making enough to live on when I exited the company. But I had money in my back pocket to survive on. I, I just had about, okay, I got to make this work in a year. Uh, and I did. And I made more money than I projected I would make, actually. I worked really hard for it. I mean, I've talked about the long, strenuous hours I work here. But as far as what you're mentioning, the expenses, no, I didn't factor that in at all. I mean, I was overbuying left and right. And then that caused me, well, I got nowhere to put these. I got to get storage units. Then one unit led to two, two led to three. So it was continuous. Well, here's another $100 a month. Here's another $100 a month. Here's another $100 a month on top of the cost of goods I was getting and the travel gas expense you're talking about. And then I had to buy computers and then I moved in the warehouse and then I got more computers um, and office supplies and the bubble mailers they don't tell you about. There's a cost there. I mean, I get the little eBay gift certificate, whatever thing that I use, but sometimes I have to order more. And then I was using the Uline too. That was an expense. Just figure out what kind of boxes I'm ultimately going to need and bags I'm going to need. Then I brought in an employee, but basically I'm making the same, but my business has grown, which is the funny part. So all my bills are covered. All my expenses are covered, but I've added to my expense column, but I'm getting the same back. But eventually there'll be a plateau point where, okay, we plateaued. I bought everything I need. I have everybody I need. I have the space I need finalized. And then, then I start collecting a bigger paycheck for myself to either, okay, I can go bigger or I can maintain and stay the same. And just now, now's my day in the sun kind of deal. So it's like, I kind of think about it almost as like if you started investing for a retirement, right? I always say it's compounding over the years and it's kind of the same with reselling business, just in a shorter period of time. There are ways you kind of can, you know, set it on fire, right? Maybe you're selling in a category that's like super hot. Talk about it all the time. We, we're going to be an iPhone seller, right? Mm-hmm. Your margins are less, but it's going to sell the same day you list it. So there's a trade-off to every business model. And just finding a way to get the cash back out of it in a timely manner, that's all that matters. It's it's all this reselling game comes out of because if you ain't got no money, guess what? You can't buy nothing. You can't buy nothing. You're not nothing new going in, nothing going to Amazon. You're not going to get any more sales. So you kind of hit a point here where you have to, you know, because a lot of people get so excited when they start reselling and they're ready to just go run up the credit cards, buy everything they see, you know, and they think they're going to make a whole bunch of money on it. And the the actuality is not everything, you know, most items we find and, you know, 95% of us resellers, it's not going to sell, you know, within the week. It's probably going to take two weeks, a month, like no matter what category you're selling in, unless you're selling, you know, you're that small percentage that's selling really high in demand items. Cash flow is going to eat you up and it just just understand like it's it's OK to take steps and build, you know, the Amazon business, especially for me being in the Amazon world. Whenever somebody new comes along, I'm like, hey, you know, you want you want to play it slow here. There's a lot of factors that come into this. Amazon's going to hold your money for a long time. So it's like with eBay, it's a little bit different in that aspect. But with Amazon, cash flow will destroy you in the beginning, especially if you know if you're trying to start this from zero. Yeah. On Amazon. And I think like, I don't know, let's talk about some tips, like basically to increase cash flow when you first start. I'll just throw the one out there is get your stuff for free. Sell the stuff around your house. Right. That's kind of like the cliche thing. Everybody says starting an eBay business. Look around your house. You know, what can you sell? It's like there's there's plenty of items that have value in your house that you're probably not using. Right. Most of the stuff you just probably been sitting around forever and you just like, oh, you know, if you can get 20 bucks out of it. You take that twenty dollars and then you go turn it into forty. Now I know a thing I wish I would have done, but I didn't do starting out is buy all my equipment used. I was buying it new because I had, like I said, I had money in my pocket, and I took the easy versus the harder thing to do, and I just wanted my stuff right away. 
So I paid for that. I paid up for that. That's the thing. Now, if I had to do it again, I would have paid down for it and waited for it to come in the mail from either like places like eBay or any place else that sells used Facebook Marketplace. If I took the time, energy, and effort to do that, I could have saved myself a boatload of money um, that I could have reinvested to inventory or given my employee extra hours or moved in the warehouse earlier. Um, that would have produced a lot of cash flow because I'm looking around here. I mean, I spent several thousand dollars in just tubs to house the things because I was operating on tubs for a very long time. Um, I still use them to transport stuff. So they're still maintain their residual value. And I can always sell them if I need to be plastic gold, right? Um, my bookcases, I started getting those on the side of the road if I saw them. Um, I had my six footers then because um, I wanted them to go into my storage and be able to fit under the door. But my dollies knew that was stupid of me. I should have bought them used. Um, again, taking the Facebook, Craigslist, next door, whatever approach to it. Uh, another one is your shipping supplies. Go to the dollar store, man, honestly. Um, go to the dollar store or, again, look on your used things. You can find a lot of things used on eBay. I've, I've noticed that over time. I just go there when I need a little bit extra office supplies. I don't need a big bulk order of office supplies. I'll just hit eBay. Yeah, I'm going to wait for it in the mail. That's the time I'm giving up. But whenever I see a pile of polys getting low i'm gonna hit ebay and they should they should be here by the time i run out did you ever play the box game like when you first started did you just collect like all the box like i had a whole storage unit of nothing but boxes a 10 by 12 stacked to the ceiling <laughs> oh i remember that that would get so pissed off at me yeah all these boxes in here because i'm in this tiny apartment right so there ain't no space as it is so like i'm trying to break down boxes i got them stacked all over the apartment but like Looking back, it was a smarter thing to do. I probably could have did it a more efficient way because I didn't have a storage and everything was in my apartment. But like, those are the kind of things you really don't think about. Like, just go to, like I said, used to have people to come into CVS all the time and be like, hey, do you have boxes? I'm like, how many you need? I got a whole back room full. Like, I'll or pull like out everyone. boxes at uh, Sam's Club. If you got a Sam's Club, they got plenty of boxes. They have their own little box, little thing up at the front. And they don't mind you taking that crap, honestly. Yeah, yes. and, it's, and it's not like, you know, it's not like you're dumpster diving, right? Because people, some people, it's it, it's kind of off-putting, right, to, dump, to, you know, jump in a dumpster. I used to dumpster dive Goodwills, like, way back before, like, when I first started eBay. Goodwill used to throw out all this stuff in the dumpster. Guess what? Me and my buddy sit out back in the dumpster, you know, sit out there, music playing in the car, <laughs> waiting for them to come. And uh, But a lot of people get off-put by that. But if you just walk in and ask for boxes... So you could just be like, hey, I'm moving. You got any boxes? I'll take any size boxes you got, small, big. And I even used to use boxes from CVS for those Guitar Hero guitars. They're yeah. so weird shaped. And I would just, whenever I get a long box that wasn't that thick, I would just say, all right, my Guitar Hero box, because you used to find those things everywhere. You can't find them no more in thrift stores, but I used to sell those things all the time. So like, even back then I was like, hey, this is a nice guitar. It comes off the truck. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a Guitar Hero box for me right there. But uh, you got to save money any way you can when you first start. And even to this day, like, I feel like, you know, I'm still super cheap with everything. Yeah, and then uh, here, here's where I was there, where I cut myself off at the beginning of the call when we just, just first started going into it here is spending some money and expecting the return to come back slowly. A lot of people don't prepare for that, especially in media. It's going to be a slow return. Yeah, we always talk about 3Xing, 10Xing, 20Xing your money. Yeah, but it's not an overnight thing. I'm sorry to inform you of this, but it's not. It's, it's going to come in. In my case, it comes in over the course of a year usually um, because with me, I got to throw enough up there to get enough hooks in the water or eyeballs on it, right, on the eBay platform um, where stuff's selling every day. Yeah, they're all long tail, but I have enough long tail where I sell stuff every day and enough variety for people to take advantage of multi-quantity buys. That produces cash flow. I had planned for this very early on in my business to do that because I knew – once I decided on the vintage route that my items are, in fact, long tail, they're collectibles, not every day someone is going to want it. So that also affected how many I list as well. Um, but it all leads back to cash flow. I want more cash flow. Well, I have to do X, Y, and Z to produce the cash flow to come in. Um, and like my employee, she's an investment right now. She she definitely lists more than she costs per hour, but it takes time for me to recoup back um 
the monthly cost of her wage essentially so i got to prepare for that okay she costs this i need to at least list this much of inventory to have the potential to pay off her thing but to extrapolate even further let's let's times that by two or three here to actually make it feasible versus the break even to me you got to go above and beyond to account for all variables you can't see um so yeah there's there, there's that there's that tidbit for you people I do think like my mindset now, right? I don't know, just because I've been doing this for so long, like when it comes to cash flow and, you know, for example, I just had, you know, like, my car inspected, needed new exhaust, everything, you know, 1100 bucks. So like, I do think about it, like $1,100, right? My average sales price is around 20 bucks. So like I run the numbers in my head real quick and I'm like, okay, like how many items do I have to sell to offset this? And uh, I don't know if it's just from being in the business for so long, but like you need the cash flow, right? Because that's my bookmobile. I drive it everywhere um, for all my thrifting. It's the only car we have, me and Deb. So like you have to have that cash flow because what happens if I don't have the $1,100 to fix the car, right? What happens if you have an unexpected emergency? You need to be able to say, okay, well, I'm making enough money. And it's hard when you start, but you should, if you're just starting this, you should have a kind of an emergency emergency fund out. You shouldn't be spending emergency fund money to start your reselling business. So you should have a separate, but for things that come up in the business, right? Maybe, maybe something happens where, you know, you have to, you know, I mean, I, who knows what, what, what could go wrong in your business right now that you would have to, you know, cash flow, like your car, your truck. Your truck goes yeah the truck goes down that affects my business i may have enough inventory for a little while but let's say i can't repair the truck for that little while what do i do right hey employee we got to go somewhere take computer a... your, your computer goes yeah, the down computer right goes out that's going to set me back but that's why like i mentioned i put a lot of money into computers so mine goes down well i got two more i could use i got four if i go home and bring back the laptop so I'm still in business, but I invested in those things in case something did go wrong because you can't plan for when the computer goes. Down. Oh, July 4th, the computer's going to go down. I better get one before then. You can't plan for that. So basically you're saying like you need to have like a slush fund for like unexpected business expenses. I mean, I guess, I mean, we, we always we kind of hit on it before. Like you should have, you know, maybe five hundred dollars set aside if you're newer to this for maybe an opportunity to buy maybe an opportunity pops up today, you know, somebody calls you, Hey, I got 10,000, you know, sneakers, 500 bucks and you ain't got it. But we kind of talk about it. Like maybe you need to have in addition to like an opportunity, you know, envelope, we'll say we're doing the envelope system again, you got yeah. an opportunity envelope. And then you got basically a business expense, unexpected expense envelope. And maybe it's almost like you can have a set of envelopes for your personal life, like your personal finances, and then you could have one strictly for your, your reselling business. And I think, I think that would be good for a lot of people like, okay, here's what I paid. Here's the cat, the extra cash I have that's going into the opportunity. And then here's the one for an unexpected expense, whenever that may happen. Right. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to speak on this for a moment. Um, there was a deal earlier on this year that came up where I had already bought and I already, I already spent my slush fund, as you mentioned. And I was like, ah, I really want it. And that, and that, and that scenario, you got two options. You could put it on your credit card or you could take a pass. I decided to take a pass. Even though I knew it would pay for itself and what I would have spent on the credit card, I didn't want to accumulate debt on it. Now, I have done that before where I have put a deal on the credit card um, or got cash from the credit card in order to do it. But that was earlier on in my business, and I did, and it made sense to me at the time, and it was worth it, and it paid for itself. But not every deal would pan out like that. It's not as worth as much as you thought it was, or you thought one something, but the market flipped to something else in the in the middle of you selling these things. You just never know. So the less that's that's risk management right there, uh, which does have to do with cash flow. You can you can leverage those things on like credit and stuff. But I would not advise it because you can get in trouble real, real quick. Um, it just takes a couple of those where you're out of business, honestly. I've seen uh, I've seen a few horror stories on social media about people that started, you know, uh, online arbitrage and they leverage your credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing against people who use credit cards. If, that, I mean, if, that's, your, if so yeah. that's your jam, you know, 100 percent, I got nothing against it. 
um, there you can be very successful if you know how to play the game. But unfortunately, the average person who never really had a credit card before can't start doing what some of these people are doing in, in the OA field. And I've seen horror stories where people are like, I had to ask my family for tens of thousands of dollars because, you know, you spend that money today you got to pay that credit card balance off at the end of the month or you get hit with the interest and people don't really kind of look past that. So I think kind of like the overall takeaway here from cash flow for me is like you're always going to want to even if it means breaking even or making a buck. Mm-hmm. You're every single as every single second passes, if somebody sends you an offer and you know you can get your money back out of it maybe a little bit more, you're always going to be better off taking it and redeploying that money again. Absolutely. Uh, um, so it's like, stop trying to hold out for the full price if you have a chance to take the a little bit less. I mean, we're paying nothing for these items. A lot of us that are flipping, I mean, we're not flipping, you know, used clothing, books, you know, sneakers to make a dollar per item, right? We always have crazy, you know, room for for basically, you know, offers. That's basically what we're doing. We're just pricing something at what the market what we think the market price is, but in actuality, if we get an offer and it's under, you know, the market going rate, we probably should still take that 99% of the time, unless it's something we know is going to sell for that full price. But don't get caught up with hanging on. Like, I know this phone is worth $300 and I'm not taking a penny less. It's funny because uh, I'll just a little reference here. I was trying to buy something on eBay the other day. They had it listed at $22 uh, best offer. All right. Well, I'm in there, right? Best offer, 10 bucks, automatically decline. $12, automatically decline. I got all the way up to $16 and it's still automatically declined. Like, why do we have, like, what's the point of having it on, right? Like that person probably just missed out on the sale they're probably never going to get because there was multiple people on the listing. They were just the only one with best offer. It's not like there was a crazy sell through on this item either. So like, that's an opportunity where they could have took that $16 after fees, maybe, you know, 12, because they did charge for shipping and they would have made money on the shipping. So they probably would have made like- I never have that crap on. I let them send me dollar offers if they want to. I can always counter. Yeah. I don't have to take their dollar. I was blown away. I was like, this is your, you know, it tells you because you only get five offers, right? They're like, Mike, this is your last offer. You don't, uh, and I'm like, do I want to hit enter? And it poof, automatically declined. So like- just think like take that 16 bucks spend it on something better right turn that six you go out to the thrift store you spend 16 bucks you're going to leave with all a lot of stuff that you're going to sell for a lot more than 16 dollars. i kind of want that mindset when it comes to cash flow and just know you have to have money come in you can't keep spending because it don't work right you can't sooner or later you're going to run out of money i don't care how many credit cards you got i don't care how many distant cousins family members you got that you're calling up asking for money because you know you've seen selling on amazon is going to make you a millionaire sooner or later the well's going to run dry and then you're then you're going to be in a situation where if you get to that point now all of a sudden you're super leveraged, right? So now you can't even think twice about not taking an offer because you have to take everything because the bills have piled up to a point where you're just drowning. And and it goes to say, get rid of your death piles. Honestly, if you're an eBay seller, there's no reason you should have one. It's fine to have a Q pile, right? That's like kind of the, the difference of the two. Johnny B's got all the stuff. It's all it's kind of like a conveyor belt. It moves it is. one foot every day. I'm I'm the Ford factory of books. It's not it's not it's not a death pile. Like he doesn't go out, spend all this money on all this random stuff, and then it just sits there and never gets listed. And then hey, look at Johnny B. He's out at the thrift store again the next day. Like, well, let me pile more of my money in there. And that's really what you're doing. You're just kind of choking your own business to a point where it's not you're going to, it's not going to work. You're going to you're going to fail. Your reselling business is going to go away. I think we're seeing a lot of that, right? A lot of people have a lot of inventory either not listed or not priced correctly, they're not taking offers, uh, just because they think that they need to get what they, through the $300 for that item that it sold for one time, they think they need to get that. And if anything else, even though they paid a dollar for it, it's a loss in their mind. And I'm I'm like, when I first started eBay, I was greedy, right? I was like, oh yeah, offer, I'll counter offer. And then Deb started yelling at me. Deb's like, just take the offer. I'm like, so, well, I mean, I guess if you don't have Deb in your ear, uh, I'm here telling you, I'll be your Deb. If you get an offer and it's reasonable and you're going to make a, a little bit of money on an item that's been listed, 
take the offer every single time. And that's how I am nowadays. You know, I'm just going to take the offer every single time. Give me uh, your final thoughts here on cash flow. Uh, my final thoughts on cash flow. Um, I agree with Mike. Take the money and run and look for cheaper ways to buy things to run operations in your business, aka buy used supplies, used everything, used electronics, used computers, used uh, wheelie bin carts, used tables, uh, used tubs, used everything. Buy used because you can always buy another one if it breaks for cheaper. Yeah, I think that's going to cover everything for cash flow. Remember, it's the most important part of your business. Take the dollars today and you can go spend those dollars today better than you did last week, yesterday, because your knowledge is always, gain, you know, it's always growing. You're, you're always gaining more knowledge, more, more brands, more publishers. And just realize, right, if you ain't got the money to spend, then you got to start clearing things out. List everything, no death piles, uh, you know, reprice everything down if you don't have the money. There's so many things we can do to squeeze, you know, a quick hundred bucks out of our businesses. So don't get caught up trying to get the highest price for every single item. And we will talk to you all in next week's episode. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Resellers Mindset Podcast. Today's full episode and all previous episodes are available to all YouTube members, along with the weekly Zoom call and private Discord. Head on over to youtube.com backslash the used book guy and consider joining for as little as $2.99 a month.